Grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever noticed that it is very difficult to escape your reputation? Once people have an image of you in their minds, it's very difficult to change that perception. Back in the 1940s, a highly popular advertising jingle for Chiquita Bananas ended with the line, Bananas like the climate of the very, very tropical equator, so you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. No, no, no. We're told that the only reason the word refrigerator is mentioned in the jingle at all is that it rhymed with the word equator. The company wanted shoppers to be reminded that bananas came all the way from Central and South America. The truth was, as is still, that bananas can be put in the refrigerator. Yes, yes, yes. And indeed, they last longer if they're cold. However, that didn't matter in the 40s when refrigerators were tiny and the majority of women went grocery shopping almost daily. What mattered was that the people loved the Chiquita jingle, sang it everywhere, and bought lots of bananas. The jingle, in fact, became so popular that it, the recording was found in jukeboxes, and the U.S. government borrowed the tune for a song about conserving water during World War II. However, what had seemed to be the perfect ad campaign began costing the company sales in the 50s when the suburbs boomed, refrigerators doubled in size, and shopping became a once-a-week event. Shoppers would buy a dozen apples, a dozen oranges, but only a few bananas because they knew that bananas should never go in the fridge. The company tried in vain for years to counter the jingle's message, but finally gave up. Once people had a certain image in their mind, they don't give it up that easily. One of America's best-loved comedians, Jack Benny, very carefully cultivated the image of being a tightwad. That image uh, was so carefully cultivated that everyone assumed that it was real. Benny did nothing to discourage it because it gave him a ready device for comedy. One day, he was having lunch at the Brown Derby with Edgar Bergen of Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy fame. Bergen, or I'm sorry, Benny demanded the check. The waiter feigned surprise and said, Mr. Benny, I'm surprised to hear that you want the check. So am I, Benny said. That's the last time that I eat with a ventriloquist. <laughs> Once people think they have figured you out, it's very difficult to change their perception. Jesus ran into this. He lived in a small town, in a small country. People knew his mother and father. They may have even known him as his role as carpenter. Perhaps he had built a piece of furniture for them or repaired the handle on one of their favorite tools. After all, he did not begin his ministry until he was 30. For most of his adult life, he labored in the carpenter shop. Can you imagine how people then responded when suddenly he proclaimed himself to be the one prophesied by the prophets? We read in today's lesson that his fellow countrymen began to grumble about Jesus because he said he was the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose mother and father we know? We can appreciate their disbelief, for we have done the same thing to people. We put them in a box. We assign them to a category. We know where they come from. We know who their parents are. We know what school they went to. We can tell by their accent or by their appearance about their background, and we make certain assumptions. And because we make those assumptions, we treat them in a certain way. Maybe if we are a teacher, we suddenly overlook them in class. If we're a police officer, perhaps we're a little more aggressive when we pull them over. If we're a president of a company, perhaps it slants the way we regard them when it comes time for promotions. 
It may not even be intentional, of course. We may not even be conscious of it. It simply saves our brains time and energy of sorting out people individually. So we sort them out in categories. I know who you are. You're Mary and Joseph's son. You're from Nazareth. That's farming country, isn't it? People are a little slow there. Maybe we'll find a job that's not too taxing mentally. Do you think such things don't happen? And I say that you're naive. This is the way that the human brain operates. Be careful. Be careful when you judge another person's potential. Anytime you write anyone off without giving them a fair shot, you may be mistaken. Robert Schuller once asked one of his colleagues, what's one of the most vivid memories that you have as going to school as a child? And here's what one of his colleagues told him. In the third grade, we were asked to stand up in front of a class, of, of, of the class, and say what we wanted to be when we grew up. Now, I went to a fairly strict school, and every time that you were asked to stand up before class, it was a serious matter. I remember very distinctly one girl who stood up and said, I'm going to be a movie star. As I remember, there wasn't anything special about the girl. She wasn't very pretty. Her grades were average, some even below average. She didn't come from a wealthy family. In fact, the only thing I really remember about her was the class laughing at her. The whole class laughed at her. And I remember she just stood there smiling as if she knew something the rest of us didn't. I don't even remember seeing that girl at school again. Now I see her all the time. She's one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. Every time I sit in the movie theater and watch her up there on the silver screen, I think she was always proud of who she was. She had a dream and she held on to it. Back then, he concluded, they laughed at her. Now they pay to see her. I'm glad I didn't laugh. They laughed at Jesus, bread from heaven. We know where you came from. You're Mary and Joseph's son. But be careful. Be careful when you judge anyone else's potential. Be especially careful when you place people in boxes because they belong to a particular group. Long hairs, short hair, gray hairs, minorities, migrants, boomers, millennials. There are so many factors that determine a person's success in life. Intelligence, talent, determination, desire. External characteristics are a tiny portion of the equation. People put Elizabeth Blackwell in a box, and that box was labeled woman. But Elizabeth had a dream back when dreams for women were very circumscribed. Society thought the dreams were fine things, except when held by women. But Elizabeth Blackwell had too much gumption to care about what society thought. So she set out to realize her dream of becoming a doctor. She applied to eight medical schools and was rejected outright. But one school, Geneva Medical School in New York, finally accepted her. Elizabeth didn't know that the professors had admitted her because they thought it would be great fun to see to watch a woman struggle and fail at learning. And after consulting other students, they agreed to admit her as a joke. But only Elizabeth was laughing when she graduated head of her class. She traveled to Europe and studied at the finest medical schools there, but on her return to the state, she couldn't get into a medical practice anywhere. So Elizabeth set up her own clinic in a slum neighborhood of New York. In spite of frequent harassment, she kept the clinic going, caring for the poor, the immigrants, the people at the bottom of society. And when the Civil War broke out, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell began training nurses for the battlefield. She trained scores of women nurses and sent them to the front lines to nurse the wounded, to save lives. And by the end of the war, women nurses were an institution in American society. No one gave them a second thought. Dr. Blackwell's legion of women nurses had gained the social acceptance that she had worked so hard to earn. 
and in 1868, she was able to open a medical school for women. She, she spent the last, her last years in London training women nurses and women doctors, and thanks to her efforts, barriers of prejudice came down and women became accepted as members of the field of medicine. That's a story that is told countless times in countless different situations over and over again. We do people a great disservice when we limit what they might offer to society, when we prejudice them by their gender or their color or their accent or any other surface characteristic. What counts is a person's heart. And here is where Jesus can help us. With Christ's help, we can all be more than we can ever dream. It mo makes no difference where we come from or how we look or talk or who our parents are. We are all children of God. We all have more potential than we can ever exhaust. And there is one who can help us so orient our lives that we can overcome every obstacle. Christ is the bread for the world. And when we feed on him, we find that we are able to accomplish more than we ever dreamed possible. Tracy Bailey stood before the judge with his head held high, his jaw set defiantly against the sentence that the judge was about to pronounce. The words of his high school wrestling coach echoed in his mind, don't you ever hang your head, don't admit defeat. And Tracy wouldn't hang his head, not before his ashamed and broken-hearted parents, not before his shocked community, not before the judge, and certainly not before God. No one would see his pain. The citizens of Goshen, Indiana had been stunned to learn that Tracy Bailey, captain of the wrestling team, member of student council, good student from a church-going family, had been one of the teens involved in a devastating vandalism attack on the local high school. He had fallen in with an unruly group of teens who used alcohol to fuel their frequent petty vandalisms and thefts, but on one night, the boys in a drunken frenzy had broken into the high school and torn apart several classrooms. Now the judge wanted to hold them up as an example to others uh, with similar mayhem in their blood. Tracy was sentenced to a five-year term in a juvenile offenders facility. Originally conceived as a lesser form of penitentiary, this facility now held hardened criminals, even murderers and rapists. It would not be a slap on the wrist. In, tra in prison, Tracy was determined to not bend an inch. He would be tough. He would never admit defeat, no matter how much he was hurting. But during a stint in solitary confinement, Tracy happened to catch a sight of himself in the mirror, and the sight shocked him. He didn't just look hardened, deadened is more like it. And he knew that that deadness would keep reaching down past his countenance and into his soul. All his toughness melted away, and tears began to flow as he prayed to God and admitted his defeat. There was no one else to turn to, and he couldn't rely on his own reserves anymore. Tracy says that he doesn't remember how long he prayed, but he knows that God heard him. One of his guards approached him and offered him prayer, Someone else gave him a Gideon Bible, and soon he had joined the prison Bible study. When he was released early from the center, Tracy worked for a few months to pay off debts and make restitution to the science and math. He decided that he would pay back society by becoming a good role model and offer, to offer for other confused young people. He became a teacher, and I guess you could say that he reached his goal because in April of 1933, Tracy Bailey attended a special ceremony at the White House where the president awarded him the National Teacher of the Year honor. What is your dream? Don't focus on the strikes that you have against you. 
I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm female, I'm too old, I didn't go to the right school, my parents don't have, didn't have the money to give me all the advantages. Don't tell me about the obstacles that you have to overcome. Our God is able to overcome obstacles. Don't tell me where you came from. All that matters is where you are going and who is going with you. If the man from the tiny town in Nazareth is with you, the man who spent most of his adult life in the carpenter's shop, the man who was laughed at because they knew his father and mother, the man who now reigns with the Father in glory, if that man is going with you, then hold on for a great adventure. But on the way, make certain that you do not make the same mistakes that others make of judging people on the basis of outward characteristics that have nothing to do with what's in the heart. The boundless love of God goes with you and indeed leads the way. Thanks be to God.